all the years that I was on the round table at WAMC, I remember being frequently annoyed when co-panelists would end nearly every single discussion about a thorny problem with the optimistic view that, well, I have hope, I have faith in the, in the new generation. These young people are going to solve the problem, whether it was gun violence or, or climate catastrophe or political partisanship. The young people have different ideas. We're going to see a change. Uh, it was so odd to me because in the last century when I was a young person, we were the problem in the eyes of the older generation. We were the one causing the, the, the disruption who had the disrespect. We were the root of all evil. And now suddenly they are the saviors. And also, isn't that kind of a big burden on, uh, on, this, on these young people? And the real problem is that we never heard from the young people themselves. Uh, and by young, I mean anybody under the age of like 40. That is going to end today. Today, uh, I am bringing you, I am going to talk with three students that I've invited in from the University of Albany. Uh, we have Chris Davis, who is from uh, Long Island, and Golden Duru, who is from Syracuse. And we have a local... Uh, Averill Park, young man, Christopher Evans. And uh, I have asked them to come in and talk about some of the thir thorny issues that they will be expected to solve in their young lives. Uh, I have told them that their grades will not be affected by whatever they say, but on the other hand, I'm not paying them either. So let's get started. I want to, I want you to tell us about what it's been like most of my reader, my, my list, most of my listeners are younger and do not know this. You all grew up with active shooter drills in school, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. And what do you remember about them? What can you tell me about them? Golden, let's start with you. Well, um, I remember just like always being like jammed in the corner and like trying to get there first before to get like the best po possible so I could be like not too crowded but obviously because of the small size of a classroom it was cramped always in that like tiny little corner and yeah. Christopher do you remember them? Yes uh, I come from the Averill Park School District and I remember having drills such like that and sometimes not always knowing if there were drills or not sometimes they wouldn't be said and then someone would come to knock on the door, check the lock, and it would usually be like a resource officer. But it was always, always had to be on your toes at least a little bit. You know, sometimes you knew there were drills and kids in class would be goofing off and not taking it serious, but you really could never know. We would do the same sort of thing. We'd all sit in the corner of the room, be as quiet as we could until it was over. Chris, do you remember them? Were you afraid of these sessions? Oh, um, my. And the drill, the drills in particular, I was never afraid of because it was always something I just grew up with. Like it was, I just all I ever knew was really those drills. Um, but I would say like it was also normal or seemed normal to me until I asked my parents about or I told my parents about it. I'd go into a classroom and I would have a plan. Every classroom, I'd see a window. I'd be like, wow. they're going to tell me to go in the corner. I'm not going in the corner. I'm running across the field. I'm leaving. I'm not going to sit in the corner if somebody's shooting. So I always, but that was normal to me to have like a plan, like in case something happened, I just run out. But that was always my plan. Or, but I would think about my friends, like if I would want to save my friends or things like that. So that's definitely stuff that I would think about normally, though. It wouldn't seem abnormal. Wow. Now, none of you actually had an experience with a, a real scare or a real shooter or know anybody who was involved in a school shooting? Last year, my there was a this kid that had threatened that he was gonna shoot or do a shooting at the school. So my um and my sisters at my high school currently. So they so my school and also my school also had a plan, and they like uh, brought armed security guards into the school like with guns, um to I guess protect against the threat of school shootings. So they did take action against that. So, but there would be like people that would make threats and that that's happened before. Golden, do you, do you, what kind of feeling do you have or do you think about it at all when you read about shootings in schools and they're, they're not daily, but they almost are. Does, do you have any, do you have a clutch in your stomach or anything about that? Oh, of course. Um, there's always like a pit in my stomach, like, 
like the feeling is just it's you can't really describe it in a way like i i read the news daily and every time like i do see like a school shooting and then like the responses after it's just it's like i'm frustrated and of course i'm like disgusted and i'm i'm, I'm appalled but it's just like that feeling of like I don't know. It's just it's it's such a hard feeling to make because I feel as if like people has have become like desensitized to like to the to the actual occurrence since it happens so frequently. So I don't know. It's like that same feeling of like, oh my god, it happened again. But like, am I surprised? Yeah, Christopher, are you surprised? And who do you blame for this? Pointing blame is tricky on all this, and that I feel like like. The two things that I notice the most when it comes to how frequent these school shootings are is the fact of the guns themselves and then the person themselves. So it makes me think of maybe potentially needing to put in more stricter gun laws if possible. And also, I think it really looks more towards uh, how there there really should be ex- more accessible, affordable, or even free health care for everyone so they can get the help that they need. This is not... This is it's just a fairly common occurrence in the United States and doesn't even come close to what it's like in any other countries. Other countries don't have to experience the things like we do. So I feel like there's more things that need to be focused on in this regard. You you, you realize, Christopher, that uh, overwhelmingly the perpetrators in these cases are angry white boys. Young exactly. Kids. That is exa- that is exactly right. Yeah. Chris, how about how about you? Who do you blame? Well, I feel like placing blame is difficult. I feel like our country has a issue with guns that began a very long time ago, just with our Second Amendment. And there, we just have a lot of guns in the United States just here already. And there are so many guns being produced. So keeping those guns in the right hands, I feel like the problem has no one right answer. And I feel like it's just a very, very complex issue with who can get guns and who gets guns and how to keep guns out of bad people's hands and doing that about gun laws and gun laws will help and all that. Um, so placing the blame to me is something is very different. I think also the people that do the shootings all have issues with mental health. Um, and I feel like that's something, if anything with the guns can be stopped, that's something that can be prevented if there's attention given to somebody's mental health. Um, so that's the one thing for me. Like if you, if somebody's, you don't know what somebody's going through and that could come out in many different ways. And sometimes it could be terrible. So if somebody's going through something bad with their, their you don't know what anyone's going through. So somebody close checking up on some their friend, or even if they don't seem like they're bad, never know so i feel like that could be a responsibility that is just to everybody that maybe could help Hmm, i see zach i would like at this point for you to come in let me hear your thoughts on all of this discussion i know there was a lot that was talked about between universal health care between gun control mental health and the the thing that i heard in common between all three of them and and rosemary you can speak more on this because it's something that I honestly am lacking. It's something that I, I, I never really experienced. And that, that, that was sense of that little sense of fear, that sense of uneasiness, that sense of unrest. Um, you know, they, they've talked about active shooter drills and being prepared and having it just be the norm and something that they've been used to their whole life. Well, that's something I've always been talked about or told about by a younger generation in the same regard by an older generation. I always been talked about and told about and remembered bomb drills and hiding under our desk and the world coming to an end. So as the outsider in this conversation, as I'm listening to three people from a younger generation and and, and an older one person from an older generation, all have that same fear, that similar feeling that my generation, I think, just completely missed. And you know, as we talk about drills in school, the only one I can experience was a fire drill. I, I've never hid hi- it under my desk or had to hide in a closet. So, I mean, Rosemary, I have to ask you, you know, how similar to these feelings, you know, when when they talk about fear, 
you know, what does that bring up and in, instill in you? What, you know, how similar is this to what you remember in school? I, I do remember hiding under a desk, you know, with your hands over your head uh, and as if this was going to stop a nuclear attack, you would, you would be protected from a bomb doing this. Uh, it was crazy. I, I was very young. I don't, I, just like them, I remember being part of the day. I don't remember fear. I, I will tell you, though, that my generation are now the teachers and the professors, and they also still have that fear because they're worried about students with guns, students with mental health problems. And there was a shooting at you Albany way before all of our time there. But it, it, a, a kid came in and uh, there are professors still who will not uh, teach in certain rooms where you can't have easy access to, a, to an exit or no windows. There are hotlines where you can call for the police right away. And then classrooms, it, it just shouldn't be like that for any of our generations, I think. And our Mayo on the Brink is brought to you by the Apple Barn and Country Bake Shop in Bennington, Vermont. Famous for its legendary apple cider donuts, pies, gifts, and for their corn mazing covered bridge. Go to theapplebarn.com to learn more about the spirit of Vermont you can find at the Apple Barn. One other thing you guys suffered, not just active shooters, but a horrible first ever since, I guess, 1917 pandemic, world pandemic, and all of your lives were disrupted by COVID for two, two and a half years. I want to hear you talk about that. What what did you miss out on? Is there a way to make up for it? And was there anything good about it? Christopher, I'm going to start with you because it hit you during your senior year in high school when they're all supposed to be these memorable events like proms and graduation. Did you miss all that? So yeah, so pandemic obviously started in March, 2020. I was only a few months into my senior year and then that left April and May and June. Uh, the end of senior year, it's supposed to be the most fun part of, you know, high school. It's the end. We're getting towards graduation. Uh, unfortunately, no, we didn't really get as much as we were supposed to. We were, we were, it was very limited. We got one celebration. You know, it was the school trying, and I appreciate that. Obviously, it's not the same. We got one celebration. We did sort of a drive through celebration. Uh, we all got in our cars with our friends pretty much and then drove through the parking lot at our high school as all the staff kind of cheered and waved and, you know, did that sort of thing. After that, we did have a graduation. Usually our graduation would have been held uh, at the egg. And recently it's been uh, held, I think, at the, like the MVP arena. We weren't able to do that. Our graduation was held, I think, it was the Malta drive-in. So <laughs> everyone came, came to came to the drive-in in their cars. We all had to make like one slide presentations of like our, our pictures, our name, our major, stuff like that. It'd be thrown on the big screen. And we pretty much just all clapped for when your friends came on the screen. That was the duration of our celebrations with school. And then when with the remainder of education, the actual like schooling that we still had left in those few months, all went online and I it was such a confusing time even for staff I don't think anyone really tried there was a lot of leniency mm -hmm. Chris Chris how about you uh sports interrupted social life school what what do you remember you would have been in what year when when in 19 2019 when this hit started my sophomore year I guess with time, as more time goes on, I reflect on how it's affected my life. Definitely impacted me as a human being, socially, my trajectory in sports, everything. I had a whole plan out for what I was going to do, play basketball. Then uh, my junior year basketball season got cut. So only having six games, then uh, we some players, we got COVID on my team, so we only had have like three games. There was no trainers, so I wasn't able to train my skills. I had this great AAU team. They all stayed in high school. A lot of them stayed in high school an extra year um, to uh, participate in college sports and went on this year to play in Division One schools. 
but I decided to go to a Division three school for basketball, then came here for track. So, but that completely changed my whole, uh, yeah. uh, everything for sports with me. Then socially, I was, before COVID, I was a very, very social, outgoing, social butterfly. <laughs> talk to everybody. Then my junior year of high school came, I stopped talking to everybody. I didn't talk to anyone. Um, and then again, again, that's when we were wearing masks, we had face shields around our desks. It was very like, it was just hard to participate socially. And I lost who I was as a social, I lost, I just lost everything socially. Um, and then in my senior year of high school is when I got introduced to meeting people again and talking to people again. Then I had to relearn life experiences that I missed a whole year. I missed out a whole year. Or, um, so the effects of that, I'm still learning and talking to my friends and reflecting about today because that was not that long ago. So, yeah, yeah definitely. And now, have, have you, like, I'm sorry. I was going to ask, Chris, if you think you've come back. You you sit in the back of my class, although you are always there and you always pay attention, but you're way in the back. Have you recovered? Are you still recovering? Are you like- I've definitely recovered. I'm definitely okay. back to that social person that I was. Um, but- it just there are just little things and little effects in life. I feel like that just may come up. That um, just it's just when you have a pivotal year of your teenage years, um, being social it comes to relationships, friends. That's just completely erased. It's a, it's a year in my life that I don't really. It's just nothing happened in my life, you're, and you're not going to get it back. But it isn't just young people. I'm old enough to be your grandmother and I felt like man I don't have that many years left and I've lost two here so I I get right. it how, how about you Golden uh tell us about your experiences under this extraordinary circumstance of a pandemic um I I could even fathom like possibly having to not walk the stage but having to like be in a drive and I'm I'm very thankful that like at the end of my senior year COVID um, at least calm down to the point where I was fortunate to be able to be in a large um, gathering space and actually walk the stage. But for my experience, um, COVID, it did have obviously a big effect on like, well, a big impact on how I like navigated my schooling because it happened like halfway through ninth grade. So I was, you know, I was a freshman, but like my school did it differently. Like eighth and ninth graders were in one school and then sophomores, the seniors were in another school and then middle school was like five through seven. So like in that time period was a very like confusing time as mentioned previously. So, um, so yeah, so I, I feel as if like COVID may have like halted my like academic like motivation. Like I was very motivated throughout the middle school years up until that ninth grade year until like um, it became more lax, more lenient. So I started to I started to not put as much effort as I know I could have into my studies. But after a year of being a part of that COVID like online learning instruction, I finally like found my uh, putting again so I finally got back onto that wheel and but socially um, COVID did have a, a negative impact obviously I wasn't able to physically talk to my friends it was always over FaceTime or iMessage and whatnot but um, and obviously like my sports was halted as well like the tennis season like I, I didn't get to play as often as I would like to in all my clubs I was a part of we couldn't join like we couldn't meet up in person to actually plan like club activities because obviously no large social gatherings but I feel as if COVID I also took the time to like focus on myself um, mentally and I prioritized like my well-being and like what I like and I got into like what I like like I got into politics I got into like reading the news I got into like rollerblading I got into cooking even though it didn't go as well as I would like to but like it, I, I developed more like strengths more skills 
during that that time. So um, oh wow, this is this is so positive. I I was looking for tales of you know being traumatized or or turned into zombies by having to wear a mask or something. None of you had those bad experiences. I definitely felt like a turned into a zombie having to wear a mask. Uh -huh. Very terrible, uh -huh. terrible experience in school. <clears throat> Hated that. Well, Zach, as the person in the middle generation, you also had some bad experience with school and, and COVID. I moved to Florida a month before COVID hit. I upended my life a month before COVID hit. I had a new job that lasted two and a half weeks before COVID hit, and I was no longer part of that job. I had an internship that I had you know, literally gotten on March 9th. And on March 10th, you know, COVID's there and Rudy Gobert is coughing all over uh, microphones at the podium. So, I mean, for someone who hit reset and went back to school and was kind of doing things all over for COVID to all of a sudden drop down upon me, it felt like, it, it honestly felt like God was sending me a message like, Hey, dumbass, you were supposed to remain a salesman and not try to go back <laughs> to school to be a sportscaster. <laughs> okay, as a professor in the group, you know, I have to ask a professorial question, and that is about learning. Uh, I found that uh, students coming back after the online COVID years didn't have masks. They weren't in class. It was like they had learned somehow that um, you didn't have to attend a class in order to pass. And um, I, I'm, I'm seeing attendance improve now. You you all know I take attendance, which I never used to do. I, it doesn't feel like something you should be doing in college, but I was so concerned that people just stopped learning or uh, reading. They, uh, they didn't seem to be reading. It was so hard to engage students online. Um, I hate online learning. I have to say as a teacher, uh, in in person classes work so much better. Do you agree or disagree? I know there's different learning styles, but what do you think? Well, go ahead, Chris. Well, I believe that, or for me, learning online, I, I just could not focus. It was just it was almost impossible sitting in my house and doing school. A lot of school for me was it was really fun. The social aspect, seeing all my friends. And then having to be at home and seeing my friends on the computer. And so half of them were in class, half of them were not there. It was just, it just, it was hard to be engaged and not be able to ask the teacher questions or see what they're really talking about in person. And then having so many distractions at home, it was, um, and I was also able to do well in some of my classes, um, but still not be engaged in what was really going on. So. Well, you all are good students, uh, so as the question is especially important to you. Christopher, what what do you think? Does online uh, learning, classes over Zoom, does that work? Uh, well, for me personally, it was uh, it was quite an experience. I did my full two years at Hudson Valley completely online, aside from maybe one or two classes that I had in person within those two years. Uh, for me, I honestly kind of thrived in it. I'm a somewhat introverted person, and I find a lot of comfort in being in my own home. And uh, although I was really missing a lot of the more personal aspect of it, so like face-to-face -face conversation with students and staff and teachers like that, um, you know, even with the Zoom classes and even with just the like fully remote, like, courses where you just log in there's your assignment and do yeah. it I liked it I really did like it because it felt like it was more leisurely it was a little bit more my pace there wasn't as much pressure the responsibility was shifted a little bit differently than it would be in person uh after those two years at Hudson Valley I took a gap year and this semester is my first semester back at school so this what? is my this is my first semester yeah going back to school so I'm new to you Albany and this is all just a very new experience to me. I never got any sort of real college experience. So every single one of my classes, except for one, are in person. I take, I'm take i taking five courses. So there's a lot more responsibility in this aspect. I, you know, I got to make sure I wake up in time. I got to make sure I get to school in time. I got to make sure I'm getting to my classes in time. 
I'm I'm meeting with students in person. I'm meeting with teachers in person. So it's all very different. And like, I don't know, like sometimes I can just be a, a really anxious sort of paranoid person. And it has me worried about that too. There's a, a lot of people. COVID's still a thing. I got COVID for the second, uh, I got COVID back in uh, February 2021. I got it for the second time this September. So the second I come back to school, I get COVID. <laughs> so it's, with that being said, it's all been a very positive experience so far and I am really enjoying it. And I really am happy to be back in this personal setting of it and like putting names to faces and everything. But during the time of online schooling and everything, especially during a time where it was needed and it was kind of scary to be around people, um, I really thrived in it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> hey, that's, that's fair enough. And Golden, uh, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Online learning, thumbs up or down? Down. I mean, it's no question. Straight up, I prefer in-person learning. Like, I just enjoy, like, social interaction. I, I feel like just having a nice rapport with my teachers is something that makes me more active in a class setting. I feel more involved. I feel more engaged. I feel like I'm actually, like, getting something from the lecture. And, like, when I'm online, I, I feel... I don't want to say it, but I feel kind of lazy. I don't want the older generation to come at me too hard, but I do feel a little lazy. I feel more like I have I have all this free time to like get to the assignment. I, I found myself not prioritizing my workload. Like I've like I've taken it like on the back burner. Like I decided like, oh, I can I push it off for way longer than I do when I have in-person classes. And so, like, just having these in-person classes, like, I've already crafted my schedule for next semester, and I only have one online class, which is actually yours. Uh, oh, your good. I'll get class. you again. So, Great. So hopefully that goes well. And our mail on the brink is brought to you by Peacock Pots. The crew at Peacock Pots is busy right now throwing pottery as we speak to be ready in time for your holiday shopping. Make sure to check out their brand new website coming soon at PeacockPots.com. And our Mail on the Brink is also brought to you by Orchard Air LLC, a multifaceted company that encompasses a state-of-the-art recording studio, event management services, and Karen's Place, a gorgeous guest house available as a short-term rental for up to 12. Donations from Orchard Air LLC profits every year go directly to the Alzheimer's Association. So in addition to uh, we have school shootings, constant fear and uh, climate change, which we're not going to talk about today, but we might. That's a burden on you um, and COVID and the threat of further illness. There's the new crisis of the day is artificial intelligence that seems to have taken off and sparked both wild hopes for the future and big fears. And I want to talk about that. We're with uh, three uh, outstanding New Albany students. We have freshman Golden uh, Duru and sophomore Chris Davis and junior Christopher Evans. And uh, let me ask you all, have you ever cheated using artificial intelligence? That seems to be the big worry of my professor peers. No comment. No, <laughs> I have. No, I definitely haven't. What would what would um be classified? Because I use AI frequently with my assignments, but I use it as a tool. It's revolutionized yeah, you're, my learning. So. You're totally getting to the point, Chris. That uh, there seems to be a fear that students will just not do any work at all and let the the robots do the work. And this is again the old timer here. I can remember the same worry when calculators first came into use. Oh my God, students aren't going to learn any math anymore. They're going to all just turn to the to this magic machine. Um, so you seem to have struck the balance. To me, it seems like wow, this is this is another calculator, uh, but on a much wider scale, perhaps. I feel like this is something that people or my people in college, people in school, I think it's something that we not should, but I think it's something that we need to learn to use. Like there's literally no other way that I could describe it because the way that it can revolutionize and extend your brain 
and bring knowledge to you that quick. Anything that you ever could possibly want to know about, you could know about in two seconds. That is something. And then there's different ways that you could type and say things to get exactly what you want. That's a skill that if you don't have that skill, you're going to be left behind on it. So that's how I feel in the future. And it's just going to keep getting bigger. It's not a very small scale right now. Right. But in the future, if this is not a skill that you have, you you this is something that you can take advantage of that can completely, that will be able to change your life. So I think that's, so that's my opinion about it. You should definitely, everyone should be learning AI and how to use it on your side to help you and, and help your brain and be become more knowledgeable. Uh, so that's a very hopeful outlook. Christopher, do you have that same hopeful outlook or are you worried we're in the Terminator situation and soon the machines are going to take over the earth from the humans? My outlook is so painfully negative. <laughs> I <laughs> I do not hold that uh, same regard, unfortunately. I wish I could. But uh, I have I haven't used AI for anything, maybe just because learning curve or whatnot, or I'm just simply not interested but uh, I, I tried to do my research in that to see if there were any benefits. And it was genuinely hard for me to find any benefits over than what I seem to think is like the overwhelming negatives. I think it's currently spreading a lot of disinformation. I think it's probably going to eventually take away a lot of jobs from human beings. And then personally, I, I as a writer, as a musician, as like a, like a bit of a poet, I see that it takes a lot of the personal human elements out of fun things like art and music and writing that like a, a computer can't do like a human being could do so that's why i've never implemented it or really anything in any of my like my education or schooling i'm sure it would be beneficial because I, I know it's super accessible i know that it's uh, an extremely helpful tool I know that it can really help with a lot of tasks and save a lot of time. I just, I can't really get myself to do it. I I, I think it's scary. I think it's just going to continue to get scarier. And I really think it should be looked at more of a secondary option. I, I, I think it should be human first before we, we, I don't think we could ever fully trust it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then you're going to be the tiebreaker here. The AI is good or it's bad? Thumbs up and down again. Unfortunately, I just have to be the middleman then. Um, at least in like an academic like lens, I do use AI in like, in terms of like generators, like citation generators, I will be all up in that. Um, I, Cause I was never formally taught how to properly like cite. So obviously I need to, educate myself on that but for the time being I will be continuing to use my generators um for citations but I I'm I agree with Christopher I think like AI is something that should be carefully monitored I feel like it has um long-term risks that like we haven't really thoroughly thought about obviously the whole thing with disinformation we recently just witnessed a big case of this in the israel and palestine conflict that's well conflict let's use that word back then um conflict with the hospital with the baby um that was going around on social media so i feel and actually we've seen this in previous years with the 2016 election with donald trump and hillary clinton but maybe not as like severe but We've witnessed like propaganda from generated, uh, well, not truly like, not true messages from the political leaders that they were like talking about. So we, we've seen like the negative effects of AI and how it can work and like um, disrupt a society. So I, I think there should be regulations on it. I don't feel as though that it should be heavily implemented in an academic setting because obviously we're here to learn and not to heavily depend on AI to do that learning for us. The the uh, students seem to have the same mixed feelings about AI as our adult business and government leaders. Uh, Joe Biden has just come out with an order that 
requires constant government monitoring of uh, AI systems. On the other hand, Bill Gates has is out online with a uh, today um, or this week. I will have to say with a uh, major statement of hope about how AI is on the verge of changing our lives in the same way that computers did, uh, making it easy for us to just say what we need and the computer will, without going to a specific app, it will take you there, it will tell you considerations you may have. He sees it as extremely hopeful for uh, productivity and for creativity. So where it actually falls, I guess we have to see. Chris, you wanted to make one point too. Can I go back to you? Yeah, I had a question, a question for Christopher about his views and his opinions on Go. AI. So, because so Christopher, you're very um, reluctant to become close to AI at all. So, if this is something that looks like it's going to be a very large part of the world, a very large part of music, a very large part of writing, I understand your opposition to that. Because I share those same opinions and those same feelings that uh, creativity by humans should be something that's promoted and that's that's is going to disrupt writers, is going to disrupt a lot of things. But so my question is, while all that is true, do you not believe that um, that's something that you would want to learn as it's, it's going to be a part of something that you love? It's, is that not something that you would want to learn how it works or learn to be or learn it so it just doesn't just take over, you don't know what's going on in the future, maybe five, 10 years from now? Well, first off, that's an awesome question. I, I really appreciate you asking me that. Um, no, it really does all like make sense. Sure, I, I really am reluctant, but like Golden mentioned earlier about like citation generators and things like that. Yeah, I use those, no question. So it's, I guess it's really just a matter of like, I guess what I'm really considering is AI. Like, I don't really want to do anything that's going to completely write things for, for me that takes away the human element. Like a citation, that's just one little sentence at the end of your paper. I want to be able to claim that I wrote my own whole paper. So I guess that's where my differing things on uh, that stand. But no, I completely get what you mean about when it comes to like the actual like writing and music and things like that. There's probably going to come a point where it's going to be inevitable and you can't avoid it. I mean, there's been so much stuff in history where people have had to do that. I mean, everyone now has like a TV in their home. That wasn't always a thing, you know, things like that. Everyone's got a computer like at home. Everyone's got a, a computer in their pocket now. That wasn't always a thing either. So it's just a matter of like time, how things change. If AI is going to continue to be implemented and advanced and like carry on. Yeah, there's, I, there's going to be no way of avoiding it. I'm, I'm very much probably going to be using it. Seems like as of right now, I am using it, just maybe not to the extent of like some of my other peers. So, but mm -hmm. really when it comes down to like the creative element, I'm just trying to keep it as human as I can. I'd, I'd really like that to be as personal and as expressive as possible without having to get too much help. But no, totally get what you mean. And mm -hmm. I, I can't really see myself just trying to be this like, like I don't know, reluctant curmudgeon, just like oh, scared of you know the technology and things like that. It's gonna happen. I'm just a little standoffish right now. And Zach, your thoughts? I will also say that the first time that I went to school, the first time that I went to college was also when Wikipedia first made its debut into the academic and professional world. So I don't think the dealing with AI is anything new or anything different than plagiarism plagiarism has been. It's just new technology because everyone's trying to get ahead. Look, I mean, when it comes down to it and you talk about the human element, that it's still AI is still missing that. And if you read AI writing, if you listen to AI music or things that AI has created, they still don't have comedy. They still don't have timing. They still don't have some of the human elements. So when you read the actual transcript, when you read the writing you can tell that it's generated. It may be truthful, it may be factful, and it may be grammatically correct, yes. But is it written by a person? Does it have nuance? Does it have substance? Does it have creativity and comedy and soul? No, that's what is still missing. And look, it's it's going to get there. Hmm, so it turns out that like the experts, 
uh, our panel today seems to think that um, artificial intelligence could either raise civilization to a whole new level or maybe just dash it into the dust. We have been talking uh, with um, members of the generations that are going to actually live to see which of those two possible outcomes, or maybe something entirely different, which of, which of them will come true. And so I think I'd like, before we close this chapter of On the Brink, to raise a glass and toast to lives that will be exciting and unpredictable. Music for this episode of An Armeo on the Brink has been composed by David Keckley. His works are available through Pine Valley Press, a Williamstown, Massachusetts music publishing firm.